Okay, welcome back everybody. Hope you had a chance to network with some interesting people. Um, leave us a reaction or emoji in the chat and let us know how it went. Uh, we are back here on the stage, ready to kick off an exciting afternoon with lots of keynotes and fireside chats. Um, and I'm, it's my pleasure to introduce our first guest for today, Frederick Castle. Frederick is one of Europe's most experienced investors. He is an early backer of category leading companies such as Spotify, Depop and Kahoot. Um, he's been focused on B2B and B2C companies disrupting large markets, often with marketplace models. He's worked with Virta Health, Shaper 3D, Zanetta, Soundtrack Your Brand, Synth sold to Nordic Capital, Video Plaza sold to Uyala, 13th Lab sold to Facebook, and Outer Butler sold to PSA Group. Before Frederick joined Crandom, he ran the largest online search service in the Nordics at Scandinavia Online and was part of the team launching 20 Minuten, a free daily news newspaper. I guess it's probably 20 Minuten. Um, he has a degree in engineering physics from the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm and is a Kaufman Fellow. In 2018, he was ranked number five on the European Midas list. And in 2020, he made it to the global Midas list as one of the very few European investors. Frederick, it's such a pleasure to have you with us today. Um, in his talk, he's going to be speaking about fundraising from second tier hubs. So Frederick, thank you so much for joining us and the floor is yours. Well, thanks a lot. <clears throat> thanks a lot, Mary. Um, and um, and I, I have to start by saying I don't approve at all uh, with, with the title for this. Okay. <laughs> There's chat. There is, there is no such thing as second tier hubs. And I certainly don't hope that there's a there's a perception of any tiering of um, of hubs at all actually and um, and you know I I um, I'll get I'll get into screen sharing in a second and 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 talk more about Creandum and how how much we love certain you know less treaded ports and and maybe cities in Europe but the fact is that over the last I think it's eighteen or twenty four months we've backed for instance three companies out of Budapest. Yes. We're, we're incredibly proud to be supporting these companies a little bit and we're even more proud of how much progress they're making on their own and in, in, in what seems to be a fantastic pool of talent uh, in, in an maybe in the past overlooked part of the world but we would argue and I think uh, you know this is going to be the message of the, this little talk as well that that uh, there is no such thing as as forgotten parts of, of the world or of Europe and uh, and uh, and you know we can just tell from our engagement with um, with Sion and with Craft and with Shaper three D that it is just an incredible talent pool, both on the engineering and product side, but also on the on the leadership side. So very very happy with uh, with that engagement. Yeah, absolutely, and we're happy to be discovered and get attention from VCs like yours. So um, we heard from Simon yesterday. That was a great talk, and I'm sure we'll have a great discussion with you at the end of your chat here. Um, so yeah, go ahead and feel free to start the screen share. And for anybody, uh, our attendees who have questions for Frederick, go ahead and put them in the Q&A function um, under the stage tab there, and we'll make sure we have a little time for those at the end. So thanks so much, Frederick, and uh, yeah, take it away. All right, thank you. Thanks so much. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna enter screen share mode here, which also means that I'm gonna be completely disconnected from for every kind of interaction from your side. So. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to try to keep this at uh, 15 minutes and uh, and then we'll open up again. Mary and I hope you can facilitate the discussion yes, and maybe I'll, also I'll, bring, I'll up, bring, now, bring back questions then. And I'll pop back in uh, when when it's about time for the Q&A. So yeah, feel free. That's brilliant. Okay, cool. Well, look, um, uh, was this, uh, you know, maybe Mary, you can just give me a cue if you can see my screen. I hope that uh, I hope that you can, um, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna get get started. Um, this was, as I as I mentioned, this was not at all our headline. Um, it was actually given to us, and 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 again, we're uh, we're absolutely adamantly stressing that there is no such thing as a as a second as a second or third or, or fourth tier. We we'll, we'll talk more about this. Uh, I'm privileged to be here. Thanks a lot. My name is Frederick. Um, I'm uh, I'm a I'm a I'm a partner. Well, I'm a I'm a team member at uh, at Creanum, which is a, a European venture firm with strong roots in also in the U.S. And uh, um, you know, very quickly on us, we're uh, we're a team of I think we're now twelve investment professionals and a team of total thirty at Creanum, and we're servicing the 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 European 
uh, entrepreneurial community through what is now three hubs in Europe. So the fund was originally started in Stockholm, Sweden, which was where I also joined in 2003. Uh, we later opened a San Francisco office, which is still very active for us in helping European entrepreneurs access the US market in a good way. We then opened the Berlin hub, uh, which then for, for, for quite some time were our only two hubs in Europe. And then as of uh, four weeks ago, I, uh, I moved from Stockholm to London to start our, our office here together with a small group of, uh, of team members, Gemma, who I think you also met with, or some of you met with yesterday, who is joining me in London in, uh, uh, on Monday. So in a very short while, and we're building up a team here that is by the end of the year going to be around five persons strong. So that's going to, that's going to make up our, um, our platform for supporting and backing the best and brightest of European entrepreneurs, um, strong hub in Stockholm, equally strong in Berlin and very soon equally strong, um, out of London. Uh, we, we back companies at the earliest stages. This means pre-seed, seed and series A. This is what we've been doing for the last almost two decades and, uh, and yeah, we've been very lucky to do that in an environment which has been, which is, which is just um, and grown phenomenal companies. We were the first backers of Spotify and Izato and, and many more companies out of the Nordics originally, but, but today we find ourselves being the first backers of phenomenal companies in all corners of the world, all corners of the continent, rather the European continent, that's our focus. Um, and including, uh, including, included in those companies is, as I mentioned, three companies from, from Budapest, which, uh, which I know is a place close to many of your hearts and, and, and today also close to our heart. Um, this is a snapshot of, of, uh, of some of the, some of the, uh, well, some of the successes and category defining companies that we've been you know, fortunate to be involved with. I personally, as, as was mentioned here, I personally, uh, work with quite a few on the consumer side and, uh, and, uh, and also on the B2B side. And really, when we, you know, even though Creandum invests early, and even though there are a lot of logos on this uh, on this slide, um, every company really matters to us. We uh, we think of it as an extension of our brand, and re it really is an extension of our brand. And so, even though we, we invest early, and even though the amount might not be in the first check as big as it will become over time, we uh, we take it incredibly seriously from the first day of engagement with with our companies and. Um, and we're not, um, you know, it might sound controversial today uh, when you read tech news, but we're, we're trying to stay very focused and very selective. So that's, this means for me, for instance, I only ever do probably one investment per year, one new investment per year. And that's because we want to, you know, we take these relationships very seriously. We're serious about adding value to our board, uh, to, to our companies through the board and, and working alongside the company. <clears throat> But I think what you see here and what I want you to take away from the pitch around Creandum is, is an amazing family, an amazing family of entrepreneurs, an amazing family of executives that is there to help the newer members of the Creandum family, whether uh, your first VP of sales or your first VP of product or, or CPO, there's going to be a handful of great role models for you to first calibrate your view of what great looks like in the Creana portfolio. And I think that's, gonna, that, that's just something that, that we can bring natively to, um, to the companies we work with and, and that I know they appreciate a lot. Um, yeah, this, I'm, I'm not gonna bore you with this. We hope to maybe um, uh, keep, keep doing great things. I think the, the best testament to that is what, 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 what our entrepreneurs um, uh, tell you when they ask when you ask them about us, I think that's, that's, that, that is our, that's our best proxy for, for, for our brand, I think. Um, so I, um, I was asked to talk a little bit about fundraising from a less known hub. Um, I, this is my words, maybe this, maybe it's less known. Um, but the good news here is that, you know, talent is globally distributed. It is at all concentrated around specific hubs. And I guess good news is that, um, you know, my fellow, my fellow investors in the, in the venture capital community uh, are for the most part smart enough to understand this. And, and this means that, uh, you know, we certainly don't make a difference depending on geography. And, uh, um, and I want to talk about how, how, if I generalize, if I generalize a lot, how you can think about, uh, access to venture capital firms, uh, along two dimensions and. Uh, the, the, the most prominent um, investors today uh, are very, very seriously understanding that 
um, the advantage, the small advantage that we can get over the next invest in your company um, can be gotten through data. Um, and, and, and I want to just make sure that you understand what that means for you in terms of making sure that you appear on the radar screen of, of venture capital firms. Um, most of us, most of us VCs, we have, we've got infrastructure that detects when new companies are registered with the public authority in various parts of the world. This also goes for the less trodden parts. Uh, one thing, make sure to make sure to, of course, register your company early on. It will then appear as a small signal in the data stacks of the venture capital firms. But also, and maybe more importantly, you should also make sure that it is registered on Crunchbase. And when you maybe raise a little bit of money from from friends and family in the first instance, make sure to just put it out there. And and this is this is absolutely no secret. But all the all the tech stacks of all the different VCs out there, uh, you know, American or European or local funds, um, you know, all the tech stacks look closely to these public registers of of company information. Just make sure that you're out. Make make sure that you're on there and that you um, and you, that you appear in in these in this tech stack. That there's a signal that detects you. So these are, and also I, you know, I make sure that that you have a web presence and maybe even a Twitter presence, because of that, again, you know, the data stacks um, that 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 we build and others build, um, they 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 want to triangulate, and and the more signals that you can have out there that point to you, the better it is. Just making sure that you know there's a people people in our business can detect that you know you're present, you're 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 present and out there, and also like these small details, you know, our tech stack, for instance, it also covers change of titles uh, in the fortunate um, circumstance that you were working at a, at a well-known firm, maybe, uh, well, maybe a sky scanner. Um, if you, if you were working there and then you suddenly on LinkedIn change your title to co-founder, this is also something that most data stacks uh, with VCs detect. And it sort of is another signal that builds into, um, and, and you, and if you then, you know, link your, your co-foundership to uh, this new company, it also means that there's just like data that tells us and others that, okay, here's something happening. And if, if it is a, as, if it is an important place that you come from, um, it has been probably singled out as a great source of talent, uh, in, 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 in our data stack. And so, um, you know, that talent suddenly moving out of that place to become a co-founder for something is a, is a strong signal and something that, uh, that, that sort of lights a small bulb, um, in, in our stack and other stacks. So that's, uh, I think that's just, it, it might be hygiene and it might not be news to you, but I still think it is worth mentioning. The other part, of course, of making, of, of being, you know, appearing on the radar screens of, of people, people like ourselves is. It's just uh, noting that our business is, is not is not only a data game. Fortunately, uh, very fortunately, because I wouldn't be I wouldn't be doing that then. It's also a relationship game, and uh, and there there are just uh, there are just um, there are just some great um, people out there who are also fellow investors of ours, but maybe do it a little bit earlier than us. I mean, Graham does do pre seed and seed, but there are also angels who who engage with companies even earlier and. Um, local funds that might invest even earlier. And for us, that's just incredibly strong proxy. And I want to mention the three companies that we did invest in in Budapest. They all came to us either through angels um, whom we trust or through uh, seed funds. Actually, two of two of them came from the same case. And, and I think uh, when, when you when you team up with 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 angels or with early stage investors, I think the, the, for, for the most for the most part, these are also great partners to us. So so it also means, you know, they, they will be able to get you in front of uh, people like myself and and, and my peers. Um, so so it's um you know, it, it is an important question to ask, of course, when you when you choose your first few investors, but um, but for the most part, the the people the people that you will be talking to, I think, will have uh, will, will be um links to ourselves for instance um so so it, like teams like day one and and angels in, in in your area are well connected to us and others and and we'll make sure to help you appear on uh, on the right radar screens so those are just a couple of examples of how you how you can you know make it easier uh, to get access if you think that it is uh, sometimes sometimes hard like the bad news of of of, of raising building world-leading companies actually from anywhere in the world today 
is that competition for top talent is just global. It's just like when, when you build, when you recruit and you hire into your teams, if you want, if you want to build a globally leading company, you know, you have to have globally leading talent. Unfortunately, that talent is, is hunted by companies from all over the world. So just as talent is, is equally distributed across the globe and just as the world is flat in that sense, it is also flat in some ways in the, in the hunt for talent. And this is really, this is, this might be the thing that still keeps some investors from leaning into the more exotic parts of, for instance, the European continent, this idea that maybe the talent pool isn't deep enough in all areas in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in these less, um, less known uh, territories. And I think it is important for you in discussions with, with the investors, it's important to you to come across and to clearly articulate that you will, when and as required, go hunt for the best talent, even if that will take you way outside of your talent pool, sorry, your local talent pool. So it's important to convey the message that you're, you understand that it takes the globally best talent to build global competitive companies and that you're prepared to do what it takes to get them. And it also means spelling out, I think, the advantages that you have of accessing some parts of talent that, that may be um, maybe especially easy for you to get because you are based in a specific area. So there, there may be specific you know, engineering or design or product talent that you and only you have because you are close to a specific hub. Make sure to articulate that, but also make sure in your discussions with potential investors to let them know that you understand that maybe someday you will need to hire someone who heads up, who heads up go to market or who heads up sales. And that person might not be from your backyard. Just that realization and preparing early for the hard work that it takes to, uh, you know, to still convince these people come work for you. Um, that is something that is, it's important to stress upfront and, you know, on the margin, on the margin. And when, when your companies grow, it might well be that you will need to set up uh, a hub for go to market or for product or for something else in another part of the world. Um, because at the end of the day, the most sought after talent, if they can choose between, if they're based in making this up now, if they're based in New York, if they're based in London and they've built successful companies from out of there, they will probably be more tempted to come work for a company that has a hub also in those regions, rather than committing to working all remote for a company that's based somewhere else. So maybe on the plan, as you grow, as years progress, you should also think about the potentially establishing yourself closer to talent, which might be lacking where you are from. This is, by the way, the same thing regardless of where you are unless you're in the deepest talent pools like london or new york or san francisco you will need to take care of this problem sooner or later regardless and you know for us we've backed exceptional entrepreneurs we started backing exceptional entrepreneurs from out of the nordics that's a super small corner of of europe and uh, you know those that were successful they were successful because they opened in other places made sure to attract the best people uh, and really lean into uh, really lean into talent with a global perspective. So I just want to make sure that this message comes across. Um, this is not this is no different if you're based in Budapest than, than anywhere else. You just need to lean in, be aware, and work it. That's uh, that's the message here. Um, then I, um, you know, when it comes to fundraising in general, it is it's not you know. It's not an art. There's some there's some pretty basic stuff you can do, and those things will be the same for you, that regardless if if you're based, you know, in an exotic location or not. It's about planning. It's about starting building relationship to the to the VCs, like we talked about before, way before you're actually raising. It's about scoping out and thinking through how much it is you want to raise, so that you can, you, you know, this is not a moving piece. Uh, neither the target group of who you want to speak to much you want to raise you need to you know think through and work through with with the people that are close to you um an idea for that so that is not in flux as you start as you start the discussions you need to prepare the storyline you need to bounce that off people that you trust to make sure that it is easy to understand and that it, it brings the core message across and you also 
if you can, you also, even if you're super early, you also probably want to prepare a super easy to understand deep dive, no, well, craft.do document where you basically just outline a, the, the, the sketches of a data room. So it looks like, it looks like, you know, just compile the most, the most uh, obvious questions that you, that you just will know you will need to answer in many, in many investor discussions. It's just like nice to have that prepared in a craft document that you can easily share so that, um, so that, you know, you feel prepared when you meet, when you meet investors. And then when it comes to the action of raising money, even though this might sound um, to some of you like an, like a, like a dream scenario or like utopia, you want to make sure that you engage investors, several engage uh, investors at the same time. The, the last thing you want to do in terms of a fundraising process, um, and I, I, I'm on this topic, but the last thing you want to do is you want to have three parties that are really interested in investing in your company, but at, at three completely different times, you know, so you want to make sure that you, you plan, so you know who you're going to reach out to, you prepare, so you have a material that, that sort of will work. Um, and, and you also prepare a schedule of, 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 of who to meet when, and then talk to them in an orchestrated way. So you go, you actually set aside a large, large chunk of your days and weeks for this and do only this and do it in a, in a, in a compact period of time so that you can build momentum in the, in, in the most important things for a successful fundraise. It's to make sure that you have the interested parties interested at the same time. That's uh, that's optimizing for um, for success. All right, look, that was um, that was the short uh, and sweet of, uh, of fundraising, and uh, I'm going to stop my screen share and hope to get a little bit more feedback from from the group here. Hi. Okay. I'm not sure what's wrong. In. Yeah, uh, I think Mary is coming back in a second. I just jumped in. Don't worry. So that uh, so I see some questions coming up from the audience. Until Mary comes, I'm just going to read them up. Uh, the first question is: Do I need to flip my company if I want to raise from international investors? Simple. Uh, no, uh, you don't. Um, I think. Um, I think there is. Uh, there is a there is a very easy intermediary solution to sort of flipping it, and that is just setting a holding company up in another jurisdiction. Uh, you know, quite a quite a few companies do that, and it makes it easier. It makes it easier in terms of for, like the the formal part of an investment is is around a shareholders agreement, which basically uh, you know it regulates the the relationship between the shareholders, and uh, and it's an important. It's an important piece of document, and 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 it is going to be less friction if that document can relate to shares in a jurisdiction that the investor knows. But most often, this can be solved by just having a top co, so a, a, a company that owns one hundred percent of your company, in a jurisdiction that is well known. It could be it could be Germany or it could be the UK, um, and then uh, and so and that's going to solve like a big part of this unknown. Like, how do we do a shareholders agreement in? Um, well, in, in a remote geography. So I think that's that's an easy, you know, easy, easy fix. It doesn't have to be flipped, so you don't have to sort of move the entire operation somewhere else. But you can just work around it. Thanks, Jongo, for jumping in. Sorry, my um, I had to refresh the screen. It wasn't letting me for for some reason. But um, yeah, that's great. We actually had uh, your partner Simon yesterday, and he said very similar. So yeah, you don't need. It's not I'm, happy, I'm happy we didn't give completely. I'm happy we didn't completely <laughs> give like orthogonal it's a quiz. advice. Yeah, yeah, we're putting it against each other. Um, no, okay. So yeah, we have some time for a few more questions. So uh, next question um, from Miklos. As I know, it's essential to find startups ten years ahead of their market. How do you scout them? How do you see the future? You have a crystal ball, right? Oh, uh, yeah, 
<laughs> I, so I, I actually, I wish that uh, what we did was about uh, looking 10 years into the future, but it is, but it is not. Um, and, and, you know, if someone would have told me in 2007, uh, in February, that tomorrow you're going to meet a team who's going to transform the music industry and you're going to be backing them because it's going to be the best thing since sliced bread, I would have said, well, probably not. I think the music industry, the, the, the graveyard of startups in the music industry is so wide that, you know, it's, uh, it's just like, it's, you know, you can't do it. But then suddenly you meet someone who has this product or who has this conviction and this energy and you get convinced. You let yourself be convinced because you see a, you see a product and you see an entrepreneur and, and you, you, you get convinced around the market that you didn't think. So we are, we're, you know, even though I, like, of course, I would love to tell you that we got this crystal ball and we, you know, we know what's around the corner. It isn't that. It's about, it's about like just finding those entrepreneurs with incredible energy, some inside knowledge around an industry that they have, you know, built the first embryo of a product or a business around and then teaming up with them and, and, and trying to help uh, the challenges that come. I think that makes sense. And then, you know, you get... Uh, with some of them and you applying this process basically trying to find the most passionate people um okay so let's see um i'm gonna pick we have i think time for a couple more questions um so yeah there's two others that are voted up so government and eu-backed investors are very common in hungary so 90 percent of the deals here are done by them and this money often comes with many constraints bureaucratic overhead should founders take on these opportunities what's your take Mm. Um, so I have to admit, I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not aware of the constraints or how burdensome it is. And I think as a general advice, of course, if you have money that, you know, if you can, um, if you can wait or if you can build further to avoid money that comes with a lot of a lot of strings attached, I think that's always better. But the question is, hard, I mean, it's hard to know if, it's, sorry, it's hard to answer if without knowing the, the, the specific trade-offs. I think there's some things that you can put up with. I think you can put up with a little bit more reporting. I think you can put up with like, like a marginal increase in, in just admin. I think that's okay. I, I, I think, you know, it's, you know, sometimes it's just the price you have to pay. But, it is, but if it is uh, constraints around what you can do and your freedom to maneuver, and if there are funky arrangements on that, that limit your, um, your, your, uh, the way you can raise money or the way you can build your business, um, don't take it. Uh, under no circumstances take it because it is, because that money doesn't belong in this industry. And so uh, if it ends up there, it's gonna, it's gonna create more it's going to destroy more than than it creates, and I think this notion that there is a that a government can know better what is good for an entrepreneur or for a startup is just a is a phenomenal misconception. So so uh, so I think you know if if it is about you know a bit of extra admin on the on the on the front side and on, on the back side continuously, yeah I you know I. But if it is if it is sort of if if it puts a lot of strings on what you can and can't do, I would be much more careful. Wise words. Um, yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, last question. Uh, how many are you managing in your portfolio? How many startups are in you actively? So I, um, I you said I, you only I do one deal with, a year, but. Yeah, but I also have been doing this for 18 years. So it's, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> and, and it wasn't always one deal per year, but, uh, the short answer is I um, I think I, I think I'm on seven boards and work with maybe ten or eleven companies, which also illustrates that in some cases, you know, as companies mature and as they become very very big, um, maybe it's just the best in the best interest of of everyone uh, to formalize optimizing for a public environment or something else. In which case, you know, we we can also think about stepping down. So so roughly, you know. Um, Two handfuls of companies um, is is what I think I can seriously what I think I can seriously um, where I th where I can seriously contribute um, and I also want to I don't mean to I don't mean to be uh, uh, be picking on words here but but it really isn't about managing it is about and, and being there 
uh, being there um, for them. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Okay, that's all the time we have for today. Um, Frederick, it, this was such a pleasure. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. Um, I'm sure we could talk for a lot longer, but uh, it was great to have you pop in for a little bit. Um, and yeah, keep an eye on Hungary and the region. There's a lot more talent coming out of here and it's great to have the attention of VCs like yours. We're so thanks we're so, so proud. We're so proud to be involved with with Shape of 3D and with Seon and Craft. It gives me so much energy to work with these fantastic entrepreneurs and uh, I'm very very happy about that. Awesome. We're going to hear from Shaper 3D later today and we had Craft on yesterday and I think Sion as well. So we have them all here too. <laughs> all right. right, take care Frederick. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.